a project going ourselves. I think it ultimately led to the end of Homebrew. The Homebrew Computer Club met for the last time in 1986, leaving behind not just Apple, but 23 computer companies founded by its members. Hackers could claim to have created the modern world, but it was a world in which they would no longer be welcome. On February 15, 1995, a two-year manhunt ended when armed FBI agents tracked down a wanted criminal to an apartment building in North Carolina. Hacking was about to become an outlaw profession. FBI, come to the door. I have a warrant for your arrest. About 1.30 in the morning, a knock comes on my door. And I didn't look at the clock, because if I looked at the clock, I wouldn't have even answered. Well, who is it? And they said, FBI. The FBI had come for Kevin Mitnick, a 32-year-old hacker whose intrusion into other people's computers had made him public enemy number one. Mitnick was sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time for a lot of reasons. Um, the Internet was you know, starting to take off. There was more at stake at that time. And I think Mitnick, for the media and for some in the government, made a great scapegoat and was a great sort of boogeyman. Twenty years before Mitnick's arrest, hackers had sparked the computer revolution. Members of the Homebrew Computer Club had wrested control of computers away from the corporations and put it in the hands of ordinary people. Kevin Mitnick was a child of that revolution. When I was in school, it was all about partying, smoking dope, going to drink, and stuff like that. And I was just really not into that, and I wasn't that socialized for whatever reason. And I would find hobbies that were, you know, basically solo-type hobbies. For Mitnick's generation, there was a whole new electronic playground to explore. Corporations and government agencies were beginning to link up their computers. The telephone system offered a back way into these seductive networks. It was a, like the network was the universe. Star Trek. It going where no man has gone before. The computer network, the phone network, going where no hacker has gone before. He didn't have his own computer, and he started hacking at Radio Shack stores and actually was using the modems and the Radio Shack computers to break into computers in other places. The new generation of hackers took their inspiration from electronic outlaws of an earlier age, like the phone freak Captain Crunch. He was like somebody even that I looked up to because of his intelligence and because of his ability and his knowledge about the telephone system. Like the phone freaks, Mitnick employed a range of skills to achieve his hacks. Just as important as technical know-how was social engineering, the ability to wheedle or trick useful information out of unsuspecting employees. But Mitnick took things a stage further. At age 17, he and his friends bluffed their way past a guard into the headquarters of the telephone company and stole important technical manuals. It was like we were in the candy store, right? We wanted to read all the manuals to figure out how this whole system worked. The offense earned him a juvenile sentence. The phone company was just irked that somebody had the audacity or the chutzpah to go do this type of stuff and didn't care about their security procedures and their security procedures were ineffective. Mitnick's arrest set the pattern for the future. Kevin kept getting in trouble. Kevin had this... Uh this uh, really remarkable ability to keep getting arrested. Mitnick wasn't the only one getting into trouble. NASA officials in Huntsville realized in late June unauthorized people had recently and repeatedly penetrated a computer at Marshall Space Flight Center. They were smart enough to, uh, in effect, erase the login, logout file. The hackers, as they call themselves, were not only smart, they were arrogant. They left messages on the computer, such as, you can't catch me. It's almost you know, like a biological thing. You know, people are hardwired to be hackers or not to be hackers. And you can see it in kids. Some kids just take to computers as saying, oh my God, this is a way that I can finally express this part of myself. The phone taps led the FBI to the homes of four teenagers, all of whom attend an exclusive high school. That's where Michael Strickland says he got the NASA computer number. And it was listed on the list as a regular Huntsville modem number. 
which was obviously a mistake, but I just decided to give it a call. The term hacking began to uh, become affected by people who weren't infused with a hacker spirit doing break-ins. There were these teenage computer break-ins that managed to get hold of passwords or use uh, system weaknesses to get into other computers. It took a Hollywood movie to turn irritation into panic. All of a sudden, there's this movie that becomes a number one box office hit of War Games, and that really glorifies the ability to use computers to break into these very powerful systems and, you know, and almost start World War III. The meaning of the term hacker flipped overnight. A hacker was a pimply-faced kid who had enough savvy to... Um, you know, attack a, a, a computer network belonging to a large military organization. The thrill was being somewhere where you shouldn't be and trying to remain undetectable. It's about the forbidden knowledge. It's about pranksterism, about trying to outsmart the other. It's about the knowledge, the intellectual challenge, you know, circumventing certain computer security measures. It's about, you know, an escape, too. As the computer network expanded, so did Mitnick's passion for exploration. He was now in the habit of leaving his wife, checking into a cheap motel, and hacking 24-7. With the advent of the Internet, there was no holding him back. To this day, the Internet is difficult to secure because it was really built to get those pieces of information moving around well, without encumbrances. And, you know, it was built on open principles. You can't own the IP protocols that run the Internet, so everyone could use them. But times were changing fast. Hacking's frontier days were over. The Internet was set to become a tool of business. Hackers were no longer welcome. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, computer hacking was actually encouraged. It was the cool thing to do. It, was, it wasn't really looked at as a crime, but as a cutesy, pranksterism-type hobby. And as society changed around me, because I was just so into phone freaking and computer hacking because of just the passion and the interest that it had for me, that I completely ignored how society was changing around me. The exploits of hackers like Mitnick became a problem for law enforcement. Things had changed. This wasn't the world of the homebrew computer club. Hacking was a matter for the FBI. Cybercrime has gained a higher profile as we've become, as computers and the Internet have become more pervasive and we've gotten a lot more complaints. But this was a new kind of crime. There were no broken windows, getaway cars, or fingerprints. We've, we've had to keep pace with not only the new technology, but the new in innovative techniques of, of the perpetrators. Undeterred, Mitnick chose bigger and bigger targets. In 1988, he hacked into the network of computer giant DEC and copied details of top-secret software. Before long, the FBI were on to him. We opened an investigation into his theft of developmental uh, operating system software from Digital Equipment Corporation, and uh, he was arrested in 1988. Uh, pled guilty in 1989 and subsequently sentenced to federal prison time. DEC claimed the dark side hacker had caused four million dollars of damage. In court, Mitnick realized just how frightened the world had become of hackers. I had a federal prosecutor walk into court and tell a federal magistrate that if Mr. Mitnick got near a telephone in the prison that inmates could use to make collect calls, that he could start a nuclear war. And I'm sitting there in court, right? I'm going, well, the judge isn't that stupid. The, the judge really believed a lot of the hype in the case and put him in solitary confinement. So he threw me into solitary confinement for eight months based on some fear that I could start a nuclear war from the payphone. He had, I believe, at most an hour out of his cell during a 24-hour day in shackles. And um, Mitnick was extremely bitter about this. In 1989, after a year in jail, Mitnick was released on probation and ordered to attend a rehabilitation center for what the judge had called his computer addiction. Eventually, he was allowed home to his father's apartment, but he was a marked man. The phone company were monitoring all three of my dad's telephone lines at our apartment. I wanted to find out who was behind it all and why. So I 
figured out who the investigators were at Pacific Bell 